We are pleased to have Dr. Sedona Jackson give today's lecture. Dr. Jackson is an assistant clinical investigator within the neuro-oncology branch at the NCI here at the Center for Cancer Research, NIH. Her research interest centers around the evaluation of blood-brain barrier and malignant gliomas in the attempt to transition the disruption in order to improve chemotherapy delivery. Dr. Jackson received her medical degree from Eastern Virginia Medical School in 2007. She completed a residency at Orlando Health in Pediatrics in 2010. In 2013, she completed a Pediatric Hematology Oncology Fellowship at St. Jude's. Then she did fellowship training in both Pediatric Neuro-Oncology and Clinical Pharmacology at Johns Hopkins. I'm sure you'll enjoy today's lecture. Hello, my name is Sedona Jackson. I'm one of the pediatric neuro-oncologists in the neuro-oncology branch within the NCI. And I have the pleasure to talk to you today about drug transport across the blood-brain barrier. And I termed it an exciting night out on the town as the blood-brain barrier being the club that you wanna get to on your exciting night out on the town. And this is within module two of drug metabolism and transport and in the Principles of Clinical Pharmacology 2017 course. So think of the blood-brain barrier as a club BBB. Um, think of it as you going out for an exciting night out on the town. And imagine that you want to go see your favorite celebrity or your favorite entertainer, and they're going to be at this local BBB club. And it looks like this, with a whole bunch of lights and a whole bunch of colors and hopefully not seizure-inducing, but everybody inside having a good time to see your favorite entertainer or your celebrity. And good thing to know about this BBB or club BBB is that it's super selective. Not everybody can get in. Um, you have to be really strategic about how you can go see your favorite entertainer, your favorite celebrity. And you want not just yourself to get in, but you want your friends to come along too to see how great of a club it is, to see how great of an entertainer your favorite uh, entertainer is. And you don't want to be left on the outside like this little girl here with your nose pressed to the window, not seeing all the fun times or, or, or being able to engage in the fun times within Club BBB. So you may ask, what is so great about this Club BBB? And how are you and your friends going to get in so that you can have a good time? Look how luxurious it looks on the inside. The, the plush seating, it looks like there's a pool in the middle of the, uh, the club. I mean, I want to be at this club. Definitely this is a picture not, out, not inside of the US, but we can all imagine and dream an exciting night at Club BBB. So if you think about Club BBB or the blood-brain barrier uh, transport, we first have to go through what we'll be discussing in this uh, class. So one, what are the cells that compose the blood-brain barrier? So who can you find at Club BBB? What main factors allow for drug transport? What type of people can come into Club BBB? What is your criteria or what is their criteria for allowing um, certain drugs to get into the uh, BBB? So how selective is this entrance? Who dictates uh, what gets in or what gets pushed out? Um, four, so the bulk of this talk is going to be on the modes of transport across the BBB. What clever ways can you get into this BBB club? Five, what research up to date uh, has been done to open up or to cause more permeability across the blood-brain barrier? So finally you get in, but you want even more friends to get in. So how do, how do you uh, strategically do that? And then I can talk a little bit about what research has been done or, or what uh, availabilities there are to close the, the doors of the Club BBB. So how temporarily, how can you temporarily close the doors to prevent your enemies from getting in or from other people who have come to see the performance of this great entertainer from getting out? But you don't want to lock them in there. That's, that's an issue. So what is the blood-brain barrier and what is it composed of? So I've talked previously, but it's a selective permeable brain interface. It's composed of multiple cell types, and they all regulate what gets across the central nervous system or the CNS. So I'll go into detail what the main cells are and what they do. So first, uh, the cells that are involved, if you look at this picture here on the right-hand side, you'll see that the endothelial cells, the pericytes, the basement membrane, the astrocytes, the neurons, the microglia, 
all play a role in this uh, neurovascular unit or NVU, the blood brain barrier. But the endothelial cells are the most important aspect of the blood brain barrier. So I'll start with that. And so I term the endothelial cells as bodyguards around that top celebrity that you're there to go see. So these endothelial cells help to line the vasculature, specifically the microvasculature within the brain. And so it dictates what drugs can come in and out, what solutes can come in and out, what agents can come in and out. And if you look at the blood vessels, specifically the capillaries within the brain, you can see that the, the tight junctions or the adherence junctions, the things that keep these endothelial cells together, are much tighter in the brain than if you look at any peripheral organs in the liver or in the lungs. Those endothelial cells don't have uh, as much tightness as, as you would see in the brain. So that's something that really um, shows the difference between the brain vasculature versus everything else outside of the brain vasculature. And I'll go a little bit more into detail about how important these endothelial cells are in regulating what gets in and out of this club BBB. Next you have these pericytes. So not a, an extensive amount of research has been done on pericytes, but the pericytes in essence hug these endothelial cells. They're pretty much buddy-buddy. And so that's where the pericyte name came from. Pericyte, uh, peri means around and site means cell. So I term these parasites as security guards around your VIP section. So you know, the, the VIP section is where everybody wants to sit and, and, and have a good time and chit chat with their friends and look to see that everybody else is having a good time. So parasites hug against these endothelial cells that help uh, protect against the celebrity where the celebrity is also in that VIP section. But the parasites uh, nicely communicate with the endothelial cells to tell them how that permeability should be, how much flow uh, the endothelial cells should regulate uh, amongst the uh, other cell types within the brain, and it dictates signaling with astrocytes and with accompanied neurons. And you can see from this picture the communication um, amongst the different cell types. Next you have these astrocytes. Astrocytes I termed as the super friendly bartenders. So you can see from this picture the astrocytes are this blue cell that's communicating with the endothelial cells, it's communicating with the pericytes, has a little bit of communication with the basement membrane, and also communicates with these neurons. So it is your friendly bartender that has communication with everybody, making sure that everybody is having a good time and getting serviced and making sure that signals communication is fluid. So these astrocytes are really integral to the blood-brain barrier because it's the specific globular end feet that you can see that are touching both neurons, endothelial cells, and parasites that help with the communication with all these different uh, cellular aspects. They influence the expression of uh, efflux pumps on endothelial cells, transferrin receptors on different cell types, um, and then transcytotic mechanisms on the endothelial cells to be specific. And then when they communicate with neurons, they also support the energy supply to be able to move across communication uh, across the synapses of uh, neurons to astrocytes. Next, you have the basement membrane, also called the basal lamina. Uh, it serves as the club manager or the promoter to make sure that everybody's having a good time. Um, so you can see that the basement membrane is in between the pericytes and the endothelial cells and the astrocytes stabilizing things providing structural and functional support in that perivascular space. Cells that are, play minor roles. So if you've ever gone to the club, not that I'm a big club goer, at least not in the age that I am now, but I did recall that there was always this man or woman walking around selling roses. And you're always like, why is this man or this woman selling roses? Like, what is the point of them? So they become really clutch, those people in selling the roses, if you ever see a, a couple that comes into the club and they're having a good time and then for some reason a drink gets spilled or there's some kerfuffle that happens and the guy who's selling roses comes about and he says do you want to buy a rose and so that helps to kind of alleviate situations so if you think about cells that play more of a minor role in the BBB club microglia neurons leukocytes uh, cells like these are not main components of this club BBB but play a minor role, but they really pay more of a major role 
when there starts to be issues. So I talked about there being a kerfuffle and this person who's selling roses may try to come in and be a peacekeeper. At times of inflammation or infection, microglia, macrophages, leukocytes, these uh, minor playing uh, role cells come in, they cause uh, more of uh, inflammatory reactive um, modifying type cells and they come more to the surface at the time of inflammation or intensity or a kerfuffle within the brain, if you want to say. So they do help to alleviate situations. They sometimes exacerbate situations. You can think if there's an altercation in the club and you see a man come up and say, do you want to buy roses? That person is getting in the way and may have a little bit of altercation with everybody else. So they do, these cells play a minor role, but at the same time, they may alleviate or sometimes make situations worse depending on what they are. Infection, uh, tumors, uh, plaques in the, in the case of Alzheimer's disease. So these are the main component cells of Club BBB, and it's important that you know these different cell types. So if you don't pay attention to any other uh, slide in this lecture. This is the most important. So I highlighted it with my uh, purple square. So these are the factors that ultimately determine drug transport. So what dictates a good party? So who do you want there at the party so that you're having a good time? So you always have that friend who's like the life of the party, easier to be able to get into the party because they're like, I want that person to come into my club. They're going to make everybody else have a good time, dancing machines. So I term it as the bigger the lipid content, the better. So the more lipid soluble the drug, the more likely that it'll get across and get into the club BBB. But if you have that friend that's drink too many energy drinks and they're super hyped up, super charged up, the bouncer or whoever's at the front door is not going to let that friend in. So you don't want a super or a, a large amount of charge of a drug, of a substance, uh, to get into the uh, club BBB, and so that's just not happening. So charge at physiologic pH really makes a difference about who's getting in and who's getting out. So the presence of efflux transporters. So we'll go more into this in detail later in the talk, but you have to think about it. If you have muscular security forcefully escorting attendees out, then you're not going to have a good party, and you're not going to have a good amount of people inside of the club. So you always have to take into account the type of transporters that you have uh, on the endothelial um, cells pushing people out. Next, you have to think about codependency or protein binding. So this picture on the left-hand side details uh, total plasma concentration versus total brain concentration. If you think about it in context, if you're a drug that's bound to a protein, then you're more likely in, to stay inside of the blood versus going to the brain interstitial fluid or brain ISF or brain intracellular fluid, brain ICF. So I said codependency does not get you in the building. So if you think about the concept of certain clubs where you have men stand on one side of the line and women stand on the other side of the line in terms of security, being able to get into the club, if you have friends that came as a couple and they uh, refuse to be separated to go into these various security lines, that's going to be a problem and they're not going to get into the club. So codependency is an issue. It won't get you into club BBB. So you have to think about that in context of being unbound allows for more passage across into the brain from the blood circulation. And then right along with blood circulation, you have to think about regional blood flow. So a weak party inside the building does not attract people to come um, from outside of the building. So regional blood flow being an issue if you have blockage, stenosis, ischemia from disease, uh, certain infections, hypoxia. So varied factors uh, play a role in regional blood flow being low. But you can think about it in the context if your regional, if your regional blood flow is low, if you have less uh, permeability of uh, certain agents in one area, then you're not going to attract more people to want to enter into that area. So specifically circulation or low, low amount of flow. So how do, does the club BBB uh, determine what gets in? Because you do have a selective permeable bouncer, as I would uh, state. 
So this selective permeable bouncer is quite picky as to who he lets in, um, who is going to have a, a good time that night. So he wants only the nicest, the prettiest, the most handsome and dance loving people to get inside. So of course that's you and your friends, right? So who enters and why? So quick entrance, uh, like I said before, are drugs with high partition coefficients, well I'll talk about a little bit later, high lipid solubility agents, molecules that diffuse passively. So those are the things that are going to get in quickly and not have a problem to get in. The ones that are going to be a little bit slower, who like this uh, uh, lady in the very front of the line, she looks like she's calling somebody, she's having the bouncer to check the list to see if her name is on it. They're going to have a little bit slower amount of entrance because they have a moderate amount of lipid solubility or they may be um, mildly charged or partially ionized molecules. So they're going to have a little bit of hang ups at the door, but they may get in. It just may take a while. The ones that will get turned away or, or say, no, you cannot get in are again the, the friends that I said are really charged upon those high energy, high energy drinks or they have a large molecular weight, or they're not so lipophilic, they're more hydrophilic. So those are gonna get stopped at the door. So if we talk about uh, partition coefficients, it's important to talk about log P and log PS. So log P is really the measure of how lipophilic a compound is. And in order to do that, you measure the uh, ratio of octanol to water, with octanol being the lipophilic phase whereas uh, water being what it is, the aqueous phase. So more likely that the drug or agent of interest is soluble in octanol, the more lipophilic it is. So if you think about it in terms of a log base scale, agents with log P greater than zero have a rapid transfer or a quick entrance. Whereas agents with a log P uh, that have log orders less than zero or negative one are limited and more likely to be hydrophilic or polar compounds. And so you can see from this um, picture on the left hand side, it's a correlation between log P and log PS. So PS is a measure of BBB permeability surface area. So when you graph log P by log PS, you see that there's a linear relationship between the two. And you see that as you get higher in your log P, and as you get higher in your log PS, then you're more likely to be some of these agents that are at the top right of the graph that are very, uh, would have very high level of uh, drug entrance into club BBB. But there are always exceptions to the rule. And the exception is that there are some drugs that are carrier mediated and the drugs that are carrier mediated have log, high log PS, but low log P. And so that uh, has them to be carrier mediated, specifically glucose or L-DOPA. And it only applies to drugs, this whole graph really, only applies to drugs that are uh, under the size of 400 to 600 Dalton, um, with a few exceptions. So log P uh, lower, excuse me, below the trend line, uh, likely have a better threshold to cross if they're less than um, 400. There are some exceptions to the rule, such as this BCECF-AM, what has 100 and 809 Dalton, but there are few, very few exceptions to the rule, and these aren't drugs routinely given. So the smaller the size, the more lipid soluble, the more effective that the drug is going to be able to cross. And think about that in terms of log P and log PS. So if you look at PS values two to three log orders below the trend line, those are the ones that are actively effluxed. Or if you look at PS values three or four log orders above lipid solubility trend line, but two to three log orders below log P, those are more likely to be carrier mediated. So don't spend too, too much time on this graph, but log P and log PS are important in determining what drugs get across and the lipid solubility context of how they're getting across. So the bulk of the talk, BBB modes of transportation. So I'll go into detail about all these different um, means as to which 
you or your friends could get across into Club BBB. And to you, think about paracellular mode, transcellular mode, transport proteins, efflux pumps, receptor-mediated transcytosis, adsorptive transcytosis, and cell-mediated transcytosis. And so this is a great picture in the fact that it shows these uh, endothelial cells locked together by tight junctions, all the different various modes of how drugs can get in. And on the other side of the endothelial cells, on the brain side, it shows all the different uh, major and minor component cells that are important in making up the blood-brain barrier. So one by one. So paracellular. Paracellular is the means for aqueous pathway between cells. And I kind of term this as sneaking in between of the wet side alley. So you always see in um, movies or if maybe you go to certain different clubs, there's always like a side alley that either the band comes out of or comes into. And sometimes the main character of the story will sneak in by means of this wet side alley. So that's this uh, tight junctions amongst these endothelial cells. That's the way that water soluble agents can get into the brain but they have to first cross through what we call tight junctions or adherence junctions. These are the kind of sticky type proteins that keep these endothelial cells together and, and don't allow for other substances to get in. So I said something earlier about tight junctions and adherence junctions, so what are they? So tight junctions uh, include zonular occludins. Sometimes you'll see them uh, categorized as ZO1, ZO2, or ZO3. And they're more of anchoring proteins for claudin, sometimes occludin. Um, occludin, claudins, and junctional adhesion molecules are other types of tight junctions. They all pretty much work together to have uh, transmembrane proteins, uh, whichever they are, to have their partner on the other endothelial cell to come together and kind of hug and provide some kind of glue to keep these cells uh, together. Uh, additionally, the adherence junctions, they're just as important as the tight junctions, but not mentioned as much, are VE cadherin, um, vascular endothelial cadherin, and then platelet endothelial cell adhesion molecule, or PCAM. And together, all of these junctional proteins work together to prevent uh, substances from getting through, unless they're water-soluble uh, substances. So in the uh, time of disruption or at the time of there's edema in the brain or swelling in the brain, a lot of times these junctional proteins will become disrupted and they come apart. So that's when certain agents can get in, specifically more water soluble agents and even more water. And so that aids in some of the inflammation, some of the swelling that can come apart. And I'll talk a little bit later about uh, studies ongoing to look at uh, modulation of these tight junctions to cause more drugs to get into the brain for certain conditions. So transcellular mode of transport, that's the lipophilic pathway across the cells. So this is the friend that I said is the larger than life friend, the one that the bouncer sees them at the front door, they seem like the would be the life of the party and they easily get in. So there's not so much excitement to this slide, there's not so much excitement to these type of players because it's just easy entrance, it's just a no-brainer in, in essence. They come in with passive diffusion, these are the lipid soluble agents, they're nonpolar molecules and they're pretty small and when I say small, less than 400 to 600 Dalton and they easily just pass through. Next, you have transport proteins. This is a means for facilitated diffusion. These are the personal escort to the VIP section. This is the, the specialty bouncer that sees you and your friends outside and they just kind of take you as a whole and just take you straight to that nice VIP section. And so this is specific more for glucose, amino acids, or nucleosides. And so it's a sort of wave of sp spontaneous passive transport via these transmembrane integral proteins along a concentration uh, gradient. So it's not against, it's along with the concentration gradient. And this is specific for glucose transporters, specifically GLUT1 and GLUT3. Those are the more highly uh, expressed transporters within the brain. And you always have to remember that 
glucose is always needed for the always needed in the brain for energy. So even if you're at a fasting state, your brain is still trying to work towards getting more glucose to the brain so you can think and be able to function properly. So these GLUT1 and GLUT3 transporters are very important within the brain because they help to bring in nutrients for energy and for metabolism. And so a lot of research has been done about the, the use of these transporters specifically for uh, uh, diseases of uh, brain cancer because the cancers need glucose to be able to function. So if we cut down the supply of some of the energy of the glucose transport, would, be, would we be in essence affecting um, the activity or the energy of normal brain cells? And that's a yes. Next, you have to think about other transporters uh, that use facilitated diffusion, and those are amino acid carriers and monocarboxylate transporters. So for amino acid carriers, uh, an example is the LAT1 or glutamate with EAATSs, which are excitatory amino acid transporters. So if you have large neutral amino acids like levodopa, it's going to use the LAT1 transporter. But excitatory amino acids are going to use the EAATS transporters. That's a lot. That's a mouthful. So this picture on the side just shows for one substance, that's glutamate, and that's these blue circle spheres, and how glutamate is transported amongst the endothelial cells, the neurons, and the astrocytes, all key players of the blood-brain barrier, and how glutamate transport occurs with the use of these AA EAAT uh, one, two, or three transporters on these varied cells. Additionally, when the glutamate gets broken down via the TCA cycle and then gets converted to lactate, the MCT or the monocarboxylate transporters move that lactate into the blood circulation. And yet the MCT transporters or the monocarboxylate transporters are important also for ketone bodies and other metabolites. And then lastly, you have to think about nucleosides. They also use this form of uh, getting in, specifically adenine and adenosine, which are key uh, for all cellular processes, and solute carriers, the SLC superfamily. Sometimes solute carriers get um, mixed in with the efflux transporters, which I'll talk about next. But in essence, a solute carrier superfamily carry organic acids or weak organic acids into the cell. So organic anion cation transporters are termed OAT or OCTs. And the specific substrates that they help to bring in are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, drugs, hormones, or drug metabolites. Next you have these efflux pumps. So this picture doesn't do justice for the generation of uh, what ABC transporters are, but I know in another talk that you have gotten extensive uh, experience or you've become an expert now on what ABC or multidrug resistant proteins are. So I won't go too, too much in detail, but just know that this picture is not uh, <laughs> sufficient to show the amount of ATP generation and the fact that these are um, transmembrane uh, proteins that help to pump things out of the cell and are really bulky and really do a lot of work. So I term these as muscular security or muscular security guards forcing or escorting attendees out. So they're throwing people out, like, like throwing them out, they're falling onto the concrete, can't come back in type muscular security. And they're doing so with the addition of ATP hydrolysis. So ATP to ADP, and they're moving against or across the concentration gradient. So drugs that are lipophilic, but a lot of times polar, get swept out uh, with these ABC transporters. And there's a large family of ABC transporters. This is just a small uh, picture of the ones that are present, but I think the total now is greater than 30 ABC transporters that are present all throughout the body, but there are a small amount that have been identified within the brain. And so the, these are just a few in this picture here off to the left-hand side but there continues to be research on the amount of transporter expression and function within the brain at the times of normal state as opposed to uh, infection or diseases. 
So you can imagine, depending on what the drug uh, presence is, that there may be more expression or more function of these ABC transporters. So there are varied transporters being expressed within the brain, with the main ones being P glycoprotein, also termed ABCB1, and BCRP, uh, also termed ABCG2. And BCRP, I'm sure you learned from the previous talk, is breast cancer resistance protein. And these are large glycosylated proteins. Uh, they're substrate specific. And they often are substrates that are lipophilic, but they have high charge. So of course, like I stated before, you don't want that friend that has a lot of charge to get into the uh, club BBB. But if they do, your friendly muscular <laughs> security guard is going to push or force them right on out. Um, and a lot of research has been done uh, specifically at the NIH uh, with um, Gottesman's group to look at transporter expression and the impact of inhibiting these transporters for allowing more drugs to get to where we want them to go for issues of disease or dysfunction. So not to go too, too much in detail because you can read on your own that these different transporters, P glycoprotein, MRP1, MRP2, which are um, multi-drug resistant protein. That's what MRP stands for. MRP4, MRP5, BCRP, again, have their own substrates that they um, help to transport out. And a lot of those substrates that have been identified have been in the oncology world. Because as a neuro-oncologist, we want to be able to give drugs that um, impact the growth of the tumor cells, but in essence, get to where they want to go. But because our brain is a little bit smarter than us, <laughs> it utilizes these transporters to transport things out. So it's a constant tug of war when we try to think about the optimal amount, amount and the type of therapy you want to give for certain brain cancers. So then next you have receptor-mediated transcytosis. That's like having a friend on the inside of the door stating, they're with me. So you have your friend that's already on the inside, right about to, to uh, have the concert or your favorite celebrity walk through the door, and they see you on the outside and they say, she's with me or he's with me, come on inside. So this is your friend saying, you know, come with me, I'll get you in, no problem. And this is, in, in essence, the receptor-mediated transcytosis. So you have somebody on the inside working to bring you in. And that's mainly uh, clathrin or caviolin-dependent um, endocytosis or an endosome that aids in getting these drugs or these molecules in. And once that endosome kind of in, encapsulates that drug or encapsulates that agent, then you have allowance of transcytosis which is that endosome moving through these endothelial cells and then can go uh, kind of be absorbed on that abluminal side and then that drug or that agent gets entered into the brain. Circula the brain. Sometimes you have degradation of these uh, agents or these drugs via lysosomes and that's okay because that's just the fate of things. Uh, but that's a better depicted in this next picture. So just a warning, this is not a, at all a BBB picture, but I thought it was a great uh, descriptive way to show how uh, insulin specifically gets taken up by an endothelial cell and then transported to a skeletal blood vessel, a skeletal tissue. So you can see in green, that's these endothelial cell, that, excuse me, you can see in green that you have the insulin uh, drug or insulin agent molecule that gets, uh, taken up by the insulin receptor. It gets endocytosed, and that's clathrin mediated. It undergoes transcytosis with the insulin still attached to that receptor. And then you have absorption to that abluminal side. The, in the insulin gets released. It gets taken up by the receptor uh, on the skeletal muscle. And then that generates for glucose to come in and give your skeletal muscles some energy to move and, and be able to go about. So again, this is not the, the brain or the blood-brain barrier, but I thought it was a great uh, show of what happens with transcytosis. So this is just one agent that works via transcytosis. But if you look at amyloid beta, which is a, a big uh, of a focus in the Alzheimer's world, with amyloid uh, beta predominance or uh, increased expression and presence of amyloid beta. Uh, 
that gets taken up by LRP1 a receptor on endothelial cells. Again, gets endocytosin that's clathrin mediated. Uh, there's a lot of processes you don't need to go too, too much in detail about, but there's a late endosome and a sorting endosome and, and some uh, level of destruction with lysosomes. So uh, that's not so much significant in terms of this talk, but this is again another picture to show that uh, amyloid beta uh, gets taken in by LRP1, gets endocytose. You see this nice transcytosis within deposition into this blood vessel here for further circulation. So it's great because there are all these different agents that get taken up by receptor-mediated transcytosis, such as insulin, which I showed before, transferrin, uh, lipoproteins, leptins, amyloid beta, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and EGF, and there are many, many more. And there's a lot of research being done now to look at um, how uh, drugs, nanoparticles, other agents can utilize this means of receptor-mediated transcytosis of receptors that we know easily or routinely take in these agents to try to bring in drugs, chemotherapy or otherwise, into the brain or the circulation. Next you have absorptive transcytosis. Think about it as celebrity paparazzi gaining access via VIP press pass. So the celebrity uh, paparazzi, this female or male with this large uh, camera strapped to their chest, they say, I have this VIP press pass and I have my large camera, please just let me in, I don't even need to pay entrance, you know I'm here to just take pictures. So it's like another no-brainer access, just gets in. And these are usually exclusive to cell penetrating peptides. So these are positively charged uh, peptides that nicely attract to the negatively charged phospholipid bilayer of the endothelial cells. So they get reintegrated via ves uh, vesicular transport um, via the abluminal side and then they get just get delivered to the rest of the uh, the brain or the circulation and it's usually uh, it's usually reserved for cationized um, albumin or plasma proteins specifically histone or avidin and it's often seen with conjugated lipid nanoparticles so like I said before there's been a lot of research into how to get, how to understand or the understanding of drug transport and how we can manipulate that known understanding so that we can get our drugs of interest in. So nanoparticles have been more, uh, more of an exciting area because if we use uh, nanoparticles with receptor-mediated transcytosis or absorptive transcytosis means, then we can get more of our drugs that usually don't cross or usually get pumped out via this way of uh, transcytosis of receptor mediated or absorptive. Next you have cell mediated transcytosis. I term it as the undercover officer with a concealed weapon. So he or she is gonna come in with their concealed weapon, uh, be it the, the drug or agent or, or substance of interest. They get into the club, no problems, and then they release that drug or substance or agent. And this is usually uh, a cell mediated transcytosis where you serve as a Trojan horse to allow drugs or molecules to cross the BBB. And that's usually your monocytes, your macrophages, your neutrophils. And those, like I stated before, are the ones that are recruited during inflammation or times of, uh, of uh, issues or concerns, either infection or, or um, tumor or plaque formations. And you sometimes will see them with drugs or drug liposome conjugates, nanoparticles, or stem cells that are giving some antibody for delivery. So like I said, this is your undercover cop with a concealed weapon coming in, giving something for delivery that's important, but it needs to be concealed in, in a certain way like a Trojan horse. So some of the disadvantages of this means of uh, transcytosis is that sometimes you can have poor drug loading and so that the drug doesn't get in like you want it to. You can sometimes have premature release of your loaded carriage so that the drug doesn't get to where it uh, needs to get to because it gets released before it you can even start to cross through the endothelial cell. And then sometimes you have inability of the cargo to selectively reach the destination. So all those disadvantages uh, come in 
in a lot of the studies now being uh, looked in for delivery of antibodies or being to looked at as delivery of drugs. So if you use one of those means and you finally got in, there have been issues where either you get pumped out or you don't want to get pumped out or you finally get in, but how do you open the door so that more things get in or so you get more of your friends into this club BBB? So that's been more of research uh, in the last 10 to 20 years in conditions such as brain tumors or infectious lesions, specifically space occupying um, lesions with potential invasiveness. So ugly brain tumors that can invade uh, or metastasize or metastatic brain tumors. So if you think about it, we give chemotherapy through an IV or through a, a central uh, intravenous line and we want the drug of interest either orally, uh, we want the drug of interest to get to the brain without directly giving the drug to the brain. Well, you saw all these means of how things can get pumped out or depending on what the drug looks like, it, it doesn't get in. And so this has been a lot of interest in research to increase permeability or to how to circumvent the blood brain barrier so that we get these drugs in. So there've been a lot of studies to look at mediators that can increase permeability. So these are factors that are already produced by the body that uh, Dr. Abbott was able to list out and say, these agents know, we know can impact these tight junctions or we know can impact different ways of transport and allow more drugs to get in. So these are just normal uh, humoral agents uh, that can increase blood brain barrier permeability. So more and more studies have gone into looking at these agents and other agents like these that can impact drug transport specifically for space occupying lesions. And so in addition to those mediating agents that can increase permeability, there's been a lot of research on nanoparticles, microspheres, albumin or lipid-based uh, agents, or mannitol specifically to disrupt tight junctions to increase delivery. So I thought this was a great schematic that's um, uh, part of this Frontiers in Oncology uh, kind of review paper back in 2014 that talked about the different modes of, of drug delivery and how it showed that I think there's a total of four that they list here, but there's multiple that people have researched on how to increase drug delivery. And sometimes there's been uh, agents to basically circumvent the blood-brain barrier, and that's been agents such as a biodegradable wafer that the neurosurgeon would place at the time of surgery. And that biodegradable wafer has chemotherapy impregnated in it, and so over time, that chemotherapy diffuses out. Now, it hadn't, has not been shown to be so much effective over time, but it's a great concept to think about basically circumventing all those things or all those issues of what I discussed earlier for barriers of a drug delivery and then just basically taking the drug straight to the source without having to worry about other op options. There's also other... Uh, research looking at convection enhanced delivery, intranasal delivery, and, and microchips use. And then there's also the thought of what if you need to close the doors temporarily to prevent other people from getting in, your enemies, or from people from exiting out. So if you think about that in the terms of uh, conditions such as early Alzheimer's or a head injury or stroke or aging, so these are conditions where there's some induction of acute or chronic blood brain barrier leakage. And so you have these, this leaky vasculature, maybe because of inflammation, maybe because of trauma. So in terms of early Alzheimer's disease, there's a lot of inflammation and there's a lot of cognitive decline. But that goes with the amount of plaque formation, that goes with the amount of BBB leakage. In the event of head uh, injury, either acute or chronic or repeated, uh, such as in the instance of um, football or, or, or other type of sporting events, 
that repeated injury or that one-time injury really can affect regional differences of vasculature leakiness that can be assessed with serial head imaging or serial neurologic exams. But a lot of research has been looked at to how we could prevent either or, or stop the amount of leakage that occurs with these incidents. We also see a lot of leakage uh, with the impact of ischemic stroke due to endothelial damage, due to hypoxia or, or lack of oxygen in certain areas, depending on where the stroke is or the, the time course of the stroke. And even aging has been shown to have uh, small amounts of leakage over time. And so you see cognitive decline that goes with that. So sadly, there's not, a mu not much of uh, agents to attenuate or decrease the BBB leakage or uh, increase BBB permeability you see with these conditions. And so these patients are left uh, of giving supportive care, supportive uh, support of the varied neurologic sequelae that comes from this leakage. So that's continuing research ongoing. So just as an aside, there are various clubs for you to try to get into. That luxurious club that I explained in the very beginning that had the pool in the middle and the, the nice plush seating. So in addition to the blood-brain barrier, there's a blood-retinal barrier, the, the blood-cerebral spinal fluid barrier, uh, the blood choroid plexus barrier, the blood testes barrier, the blood lymph barrier, the blood thymus barrier, the blood air barrier, the blood biliary barrier. There's so many different Bar blood b -b -b barriers. There's so many different uh, types. Um, this talk is just exclusive to the blood-brain barrier, which I have a deep passion for, but there's so many other different types of barriers. They're not as, um, I wouldn't say they're as detailed in terms of the tightness of the endothelial cells and limiting restriction and these uh, forceful bouncers at the front but they're just as important and there have been a, a lot of research that's been done in these barrier various barrier clubs. But they're not as cool as the BBB club, I have to say. So I thought this was a great picture um, by Zhao in a, a cell paper that was put out in 2015. And in essence, it goes through all the, the detailed transporter uh, functions of the main key players of the blood-brain barrier. I'm not gonna at all describe this picture in detail, but I, I'm a visual learner, as you probably can see from the, the way that I uh, gave this talk and the fact that I had a lot of pictures and, and, and a lot of animations, but I thought this was a great picture that uh, his group was able to show in terms of transport and key mediators of the blood-brain barrier and BBB in depth. So, if you didn't get enough from this talk, then I would say to refer to this um, review paper because it goes into a lot of detail in terms of key players and, and what they do. So in summary, the BBB is a selective wall that protects the brain. Uh, drug transport across the BBB is dependent on many factors, specifically size, specifically charge, lipophilicity, polarity, protein binding and research is ongoing to influence permeability for varied CNS disorders. I'd like to thank you for joining me today to talk about the blood-brain barrier and the transport across it. And if you have any questions regarding this matter, please email me.